uh, welcome. And uh, without further ado, I'll uh, uh, invite our uh, State Secretary, Diana Asma, uh, to welcome you all to the meeting. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, David. Um, afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining in. We want to give you a quick, brief outline of exactly what your entitlements and what we've been able to negotiate for you. But there is some good news. When I say there is good news, this EBA has been very difficult negotiated for you by David Eden, our Assistant Secretary, and Cameron Granger, our Senior Industrial Officer. It's very unfortunate I couldn't see you in person to explain this more in detail, but obviously this is the best I could do. But what I want to tell you is this. Your EBA negotiations, as much as it's been difficult, as much as the government has said 2% is a maximum that you would get as a percentage increase, which has now dropped down to 1.5%, there was pillars, ways around where we could get you more um, increases such as bonuses, et cetera, which they will explain to you shortly. But I can tell you, you are getting a lot more than that. You're getting a lot more increases and bonuses to help you in your future. But um, I just want to say a quick thank you to all the hard work you do. We can't do without pathology. Pathology is a very important sector within the health sector, including, of course, all the lab technicians, the lab assistants, all of your works. So thank you to all your hard work. And now without further much for me to say, I'd like to actually pass it to David Eden and Cameron Granger to give you an overview about exactly what your entitlements will be. Thanks everyone, see you soon, bye. Thanks Diana, and unless you have all been living under a rock uh, and don't know, Diana Asma uh, was a phlebotomist and a lab assistant, so if uh, Cameron and I uh, didn't get you guys a really good deal, uh, we had uh, the boss to answer to. So uh, what we'll do is uh, start the presentation now, it'll come in two parts, there'll be a, what's going to be uh, in it for everybody, uh, regards to classification, then we'll hone in on the specifics for your classifications who are uh, here uh, for this particular session. Um, if you go to um, the second slide, thank you very much. So quite often uh, what a union will do is start talking about, you know, the Fair Work Act and various causes and, and, and start quoting, uh, you know, the, the Fair Work Act and, 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 and talk about enterprise bargaining as though everyone else understands what we have to say and, uh, and, and our members' eyes glaze over and they think that we're talking a foreign language. So what I thought I'd do is give you a really basic analogy tonight and that is that all enterprise bargaining agreements have a, a modern award that sits underneath them. An enterprise bargaining agreement enhances the modern award. So to use the cake analogy, the modern award is the cake and your enterprise bargaining agreement is the icing and the lollies and the, and the candles and everything that goes on top. Now, enterprise bargaining is um, interesting process too, where we go around and we engage with our membership, we run surveys, we you know, speak to you guys one-on-one -on -one and say, look, if you had a wish list, what would you like to see sitting on top of that cake? But we're not the only ones that go through that process. Your employers also do that. So ultimately the government's the employer. They go through uh, uh, their organisation, VHEA, to engage with your bosses and, and, and drop their own wish list. And what happens is that when we come together to negotiate, we throw our wish lists on the table and negotiations commence. And of course, you always try and throw a little bit of extra on it's like selling a car privately you will always whack another 500 bucks on it if someone's silly enough to come along and pay your full price and all, all the you know best to you uh, but what will happen is most likely someone will come along and try and negotiate you down and what happens is that you negotiate it down uh, the uh, you get exactly what you're wanting for the car the person who's bought it uh, you know is on cloud nine they've got themselves a bargain as far as they're concerned so enterprise bargain is very similar to that where we'll always uh, put a little bit of extra on and uh, what ends up happening through bargaining is we land somewhere between uh, the two wish lists next slide thanks mate Diana uh, touched on the fact that we were dealing with a very strict government's wages policy. The government wages policy when we commenced bargaining was 2%. Uh, it's now 1.5% uh, since the uh, start of this financial year. Uh, there was the ability to access additional funds above the 2% uh, through uh, Pillar 3. And I'll describe what Pillar 3 is. Go to the next slide. Next slide, thanks, Jose. 
So pillar three could be where we're supporting other government uh, priorities or initiatives. And the TAFE system is one of those areas that we identified that the government's invested heavily in and yet it's not doing too well. So through our workplace trainer careers advisors that we have in every hospital uh, in Victoria, we see them as a funnel into the TAFE system. And with a lot of our membership either having no formal qualifications or a certificate three, a uh, certificate four or diploma, there's opportunities for people to go back and do further education through the TAFE system. So we were able to leverage additional funds for particular classifications where we're able to incorporate uh, TAFE courses. The other area that we're able to address or get extra funding through is where there's been a particular classification that hasn't done so well out of bargaining in the past. And uh, we've been able to uh, attract additional funding to address those who have been essentially left behind. The, uh, the other area that we can get funding for is where we can clearly identify it's a predominantly female work group and, uh, and they may be working uh, you know, very similar types of roles to their male counterparts, but earning a lot less wages or retiring with a lot less in their pocket as a result of being a woman. So we're able to access additional uh, funds uh, where we're able to demonstrate that women weren't doing as well as men in particular areas of health. Next slide, thanks, Matt. So uh, how would you like an extra week's uh, annual leave? If you're currently receiving four, four weeks annual leave because you're a Monday to Friday worker, uh, guess what? You're going to get five weeks annual leave a year. And if you are currently getting five weeks annual leave a year because you're a shift worker and you're working weekends, you're going to get six weeks annual leave a year. That's right, an extra week's annual leave for everyone. But as I said earlier, it's all about negotiation and this one didn't come without a catch. So what we've got on the next slide, thank you, thank you very much, Jose, uh, is this is the catch. And this is um, exactly the same as what the nurses have had in their enterprise bargaining agreement for a very, very long time. It's the, what the medical scientists also negotiated into their agreement four years ago. And this is what we're proposing under this agreement to pay for the additional week's annual leave under the current Enterprise Barney Agreement, if you work a public holiday, you get double time and a half under the new agreement will be double time. If you're on a roster day off and you're full time, uh, it is time and a half uh, penalty under the current uh, agreement. Under the new agreement will be single time. And if you're a part-time employee under the current agreement and you would ordinarily work the day of the week, the public holiday falls on, but you're rostered off, and ordinarily is they'll go over the last six months and see if you'd normally work that day of the week. And if you do 50% more, uh, you ordinarily would uh, work it. Then you get paid a time and a half payment under the new agreement. What will happen is that regardless of whether you ordinarily work that day of the week or not, what will happen is that the employers will average your uh, uh, hours of work for that particular day and uh, pay you uh, those hours for that day that you're rostered off. We're seeing fewer and fewer of our members getting access to the paid time off, uh, sorry, the paid uh, or the roster day off uh, uh, benefit because more and more of our members are part-time and uh, the employers are manipulating rosters in such a way that uh, fewer and fewer of our part-time members are ordinarily working the day of the week that the public holiday uh, falls on or the employer will move their um, uh, roster days off around and um, say, for example, uh, whether, whether you're full-time or part-time, you've got Monday, Tuesday off, they're your rostered days off, public holiday falls on the Wednesday, the employer approaches you and says, public holiday on Wednesday, it's going to be pretty quiet, we won't need you. So what's happening is that our members are getting paid single time for that rostered day off and not a public holiday benefit because it's not a rostered day off, it's an additional day and that won't change in the new agreement either. Next slide, thanks, mate. Long service leave access after seven years, magnificent. Uh, we've got an aging workforce. Uh, we are getting replaced uh, by younger workers. They're more transient. They're less likely to stay in their position for 10 years to get a long service leave entitlement. It's a bit of a pipe dream for them. So what we've done is uh, the nurses agreements hot off the press. Uh, two months ago, it was certified. We've cut uh, their long service leave uh, clause out and dropped it straight into this enterprise bargaining agreement. So as of July this year, if you've got long nine years of service, you can access 
your long service leave on a priority basis based on the State Long Service Leave Act. If uh, and next year you'll be able to access your long service leave after eight years and the following year you'll be able to access long service leave after seven years of service. It's a pro rata amount based on the State Long Service Leave Act. What happens at 10 years is you, you just go back uh, under the pre-modern award long service leave entitlement. So there's, there's, they, are, they do accrue at different rates. The State Long Service Leave Act is 13 weeks after 10 years. The uh, uh, pre-modern award entitlement that you will then revert to after 10 years is 17 weeks. So it is a higher rate of accrual, but it gives people an opportunity to access long service leave uh, at an earlier time. It might keep younger people working in the health industry, uh, but or it might uh, enable them to access long service leave for study purposes, for as, uh, for example, as well. So that's a great uh, outcome for our members. Next slide, thanks, bud. Uh, so yeah, how would you like an ADO uh, once a month? Uh, we're seeing uh, more and more often employers are employing people at 37 and a half hours a week instead of 38. Why? Uh, so they can avoid their uh, requirement to provide them with an ADO. Uh, what we've been able to negotiate is any employee who's currently working 37 hours a week or more a week uh, can request a system of work that provides for a monthly rostered day off or an ADO. That doesn't mean you work 37 hours a week and get an ADO once a month. You would have your weekly hours increased to 40 and you would get access to an ADO once a month uh, to enjoy a long weekend uh, with your family. Next slide, thanks, Matt. With um, workload issues aren't just unique to our membership. Uh, the, the AMA have also, you know, for a very long time had issues with their doctors in hospitals with their workloads. What this union's been doing uh, with WorkSafe for the last two years is developing guidance material uh, for dealing with workplace fatigue. And that guidance material is that uh, if, if the employers adopt everything that's in that guidance material, they're considered to be OHS compliant. What we've done is that guidance material we've embedded into our enterprise bargaining agreement. So the hospitals have to uh, adopt the principles set out in fatigue guidance material from WorkSafe. If they don't, they're not going to be OHS compliant. At the moment, you raise workload issues with the employer. The employer goes through the grievance procedure with you. Uh, you know, the status quo, you continue to do your work until your grievance is resolved and it never ever gets resolved. Where this is going to be very, um, very strict and very quick, you raise workload issues uh, through this clause, they're going to have to be dealt with under the OHS clause of this agreement. And that is an immediate action uh, to address workload and fatigue issues uh, that you guys are facing. Next slide, thanks. Uh, if you are an OHS rep, you know you're entitled to five days basic training. Uh, if you haven't had it yet, uh, we suggest um, be safe for regional members and, uh, uh, and Victorian Trades Hall Council for our city membership. Uh, if you are an elected health and safety rep, you've had your five day basic course. You're also uh, entitled, of course, to the one day updates every year. You're entitled to that. If you don't have an OHS representative in your department, we encourage you to do so. If you are an OHS rep, please let us know as well because um, we can update our database. Our OHS reps receive more updates around OHS issues than what our general membership does. Uh, if you don't have an OHS rep, and uh, you'd like to have an election, contact your organiser and we'll help you organise uh, an election for your department. So uh, it's very important to have an OHS rep and there's going to be a little something in it for OHS reps as well. Next slide, thanks, mate. So under this agreement, and it's going to be at the employer's discretion, but um, as I've been working with WorkSafe um, for some time now in the background, and they want to run a trial of where this is going to be adopted to see if it actually reduces injuries in the workplace. When I was working at St. John of God Healthcare in Ballarat, I was elected as a health and safety rep for my department, went off, did my five-day basic course, come back full of enthusiasm, uh, did my regular OHS uh, checks and made sure that people were trained to use various bits of equipment in, the, in uh, my unit. And uh, what happened was I was approached by the health and safety manager and asked to come over uh, one day a fortnight on secondment. Uh, to work with him and uh, said love to. He cleared it with my boss. And from then on, I went over and worked in the OHS department one day a fortnight. 
I wasn't the only OH nest rep that was over there. Uh, there was others on Secomet as well, and one of them was a chef, and she was very enthusiastic around uh, OH nest. Took me a while to work out why this arrangement had occurred there. St. John had a very good record when it comes to health and safety. This manager wasn't from the health industry, and what was happening is we were educating him. He was asking the, you know, the right questions. He was getting informed, and he, through those conversations, were able to uh, develop really good policies and procedures to protect, protect people uh, working in that hospital. But it was a two-way street. We also learnt a lot from uh, that health and safety manager as well. And the OHS rep from the kitchen was inspired to go on and do a certificate for an OHS, and uh, she replaced him as the OHS manager at the hospital when he retired. So I think it's a great opportunity for OHS reps to do a succumbent arrangement uh, up into the health and safety department. And my dream is to see more of our members who have a more thorough understanding of the health industry working as health and safety managers in our hospitals and our health care services. Next. Slide, thanks, Mark. So, no one's arguing any younger. Uh, you know, injuries aren't always uh, a broken arm or a uh, lacerated uh, leg. It could be uh, that you've just simply worn out a body part because you've just been doing the same job day in, day out. You've got a repeated stress injury. Or it might be, as I said before, we've got an aging workforce. Uh, our average age of our member is 53 working in the public health system. And unfortunately we have represented the odd member who's had early onset Alzheimer's. How employers tend to deal with uh, people who aren't performing at the same level as they once were. And I'll use a patient services assistant as an example where a patient service assistant might have been able to make their 30 beds a day. And uh, just recently they're only getting through 15. They get dragged into the office and put on, put on a performance improvement plan. Now, what this uh, clause that we've introduced does is that where it's identified that you've got a disability, uh, whether it's acquired through a workplace injury or otherwise, the employer cannot put you on a performance improvement plan. They've got to deal with it under another, another clause, an equal opportunity clause, where they've got to put the uh, make reasonable adjustments to your work to enable you to continue to work for that organisation. That's, that's a fantastic outcome. We, we're getting sick of seeing our older members getting performance improvement planned out of employment when it's simply the case that they've worn something out and if the employer puts appropriate uh, changes into their workplace or supports they can continue to work for many years if they wish to next next slide thanks mate uh, we have workplace trainer careers advisors in every hospital across victoria we negotiated that under your uh, current enterprise bargaining agreement under this agreement, uh, we're proposing to expand their role, and that is that where a position has been deemed to be redundant by the employer, the Workplace Trainer Careers Advisor comes in at the earliest possible convenience to help with retraining and redeployment of the redundant uh, individual. Or if someone has suffered a workplace injury and they can't return to their pre-injury uh, uh, employment, then the Workplace Trainer Careers Advisor will get involved for retraining and possible redeployment. And that might mean that, that not retraining redeployment within the same organisation. It might be that they um, give you uh, your skills uh, to get jobs elsewhere outside of the health industry as well. And a good example of where they did that really well was in Adelaide when they closed the Holden factory up there. They knew all those positions were going to be made redundant. The employer invested in workplace training career advisors and retrained all those manufacturing staff into, into health and disability and aged care, where they were able to uh, continue to um, have uh, uh, a, a career in, the, in those areas. Next slide, thanks, Matt. We've expanded uh, the Workplace Trainer Careers Advisors by another 15 EFT across the state of Victoria. This union has invested heavily in uh, op opportunities for our members to have a career in the health industry. Currently 30, 30 EFT across the state. We're going to increase that by another 15, taking it to 45 EFT across the state of Victoria. Uh, we, won't, we won't stop investing in our uh, members' uh, future. Next slide. Thanks, Ben. 
I don't know uh, if you guys have heard this uh, personally, but um, it certainly gets reported to us uh, through our membership where someone approaches their supervisor or manager and asks for some study leave because they're studying the course. The employer goes, what's that got to do with your current role here? Uh, you know, nothing. I just want to advance my career. Uh, well, no, you can't have your study leave. Well, we've shaken that up. We've fixed that clause up. If you approach your uh, supervisor or manager and say you want some study leave to do a course that's health industry related, they will not be able to refuse in the future. You can also enter into flexible work arrangements. So where a course might be on a particular day that you're ordinarily rostered, you can arrange to work another shift uh, to enable you to uh, attend TAFE or, or training on those particular days. It might be that you have a clinical placement at the end of that course. Well, that flexible work arrangement can also be entered into to, to allow you time off to attend those clinical placements. We've also negotiated um, for employees who have no formal qualifications and the lowest paid uh, in our sector, uh, incentive, uh, education incentive allowances. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in your um, presentation. Next slide. As I mentioned before, out of the three pillars, uh, where we've been identified able to identify that women uh, have typically got uh, less earnings than men, and it might be over the entire um, work life. And uh, superannuation is an excellent example of that. Why do women retire with less in their superannuation than men? Because women typically take periods of time off of parental leave. What we've been able to negotiate is that not only will superannuation be um, paid into everybody's super account on a four weekly basis instead of a three monthly basis because that compounding interest is better in your super account than the employer's account. What we've been able to negotiate is that the employer will make superannuation contributions into the person on parental leaves uh, superannuation account, not only for the paid component, the three months, but the entire 12 months. So the employer will look at what your previous 12 months earnings were and they will contribute into your super account every four weeks, a contribution based on your um, pre-parental leave entitlement. And it's not just for women, it's for same-sex couples as well, obviously. So that's an absolutely fantastic outcome and uh, in the long term, we'll address that inequity that exists between men and women uh, being able to retire and retire comfortably. Next slide. Uh, we, we don't see a lot of disputation with your classifications, but there is a new classification structure coming in. So who knows what it might trigger. Uh, instead of taking the uh, classification disputes off to the Fair Work Commission, which can be very problematic, it's, uh, it takes months for it to get a listing. And then uh, the commissioner we have it before might not be from the health industry. And then he'll take another several months to hand down his decision. So it's a really lengthy process. There's an industry review panel being established. It's not just our union that we're using, it will be other health industry unions as well. So if there's a dispute around a classification, it will be held uh, uh, or heard before an independent chair, most likely a retired commissioner with a health industry background, who has the knowledge of the health industry. And, uh, and it is only available for union members uh, to take their cases to this panel, uh, to have it reviewed, to ensure that they're being uh, classified correctly. That's it for this presentation. Uh, what I'll do is play a really short video to show you exactly what the workplace trainer careers advisor role is uh, in, the, in the health sector. Thanks, Jose. Baby, you 
Jose, that gives you a good idea uh, of what the Workplace Trainer Careers Advisor role is and the fact that we've got 45 EFT across the state. There's one in every hospital and they're there to help you uh, progress your career. Now onto the um, pathology um, presentation uh, and uh, slide two, nauseous work allowance. Uh, one December or pay period containing one December each year. Uh, you will receive a $350 nauseous allowance payment. So that's for pathology collectors, lab assistants, and pathology technicians. So uh, just before Christmas, uh, $350 uh, nauseous allowance that will be paid every year, 1 December. Next slide. Thanks, mate. As mentioned before, we're investing in uh, uh, education and uh, Pathology collector, lab assistants, and pathology technician grade ones will receive an education incentive allowance of $500 a year. This year will be a once-off lump sum, most likely in September, but uh, every year after that, it will be paid in two amounts of $250, once in March and one in September. So this is payable only to the grade one, so those who don't have any formal qualifications I know a lot of courses are free, but it's sometimes the uh, the materials that you need or the fact that many courses are now online and people need computers. So this is to help those who have a financial barrier to going on and doing further education. Next one, thanks, mate. So there's a translation uh, table here. So if you're in, in the other classifications like the... Um, uh, the uh, pathology technician and the laboratory assistant definitions don't change. They, they remain the same. I tried to change them, uh, but it was just a bridge too far for the employers to get their head around. Uh, but the pathology collector classification absolutely needed an overhaul. And there's an automatic translation table here before you. So if you're a pathology collector in training, what will happen is that you'll automatically go across to a collector grade one. If you're a pathology collector grade one, you'll automatically go across to a pathology collector grade two. And if you're a pathology collector grade two, you'll automatically go across to a pathology collector grade four. Now, um, just because that's automatic, doesn't mean to say that there will be um, not be a further assessment to ensure uh, that you have gone into the right classification. And there are two new ones there you might see as well. And that's the pathology collector mobile collector and also the pathology collector grade three. And I'll go, um, I'll get to the definitions shortly. Next slide, thanks mate. So um, as uh, Diana and I mentioned earlier, the is a very strict government wages policy of 2% unless you can argue uh, additional uplifts through wage pillar three. Laboratory assistants, pathology collectors and uh, pathology technicians overall fared much better than the government wages policy. So if you're a lab assistant grade one, for example, 17.8% increase over the life of the agreement. Sounds a little better than uh, eight, doesn't it? 26.5 for uh, lab assistance grade two, 31.7% uh, for lab assistance grade three. That is absolutely huge. And why did we get those uh, uplifts? 
is because essentially you guys have been massively left behind, really left behind the rest of the technicians and the allied health assistants and other classifications. And quite often it's because you're hidden away. Uh, we, we don't know where you're hiding in your, uh, in, in your labs, in your labs that we're not allowed to get access to because they're restricted areas and all the rest of it. If you're a laboratory assistant, reach out to us, arrange a meeting uh, with the organizer and we'd love to come and talk to more and more lab assistants. Pathology collectors, uh, we're looking at a 14% wage increase as a grade one, an 18.8% as a grade two, and a 19.9% uh, as a grade three. And once again, that's because your classification has been terribly, terribly left behind. And uh, we're, we're addressing that in this enterprise bargaining agreement. There is no percentage increases next to the pathology collector grade four or the mobile collector because they're brand new. So we can't, we're not putting um, a percentage increase over that. But what might happen is that you might be currently a pathology collector grade two, you go across to the new pathology collector grade two classification but it might be that you're a collector reliever or a mobile collector, you actually go up to that level. So not only would you potentially get a 19.9% uh, know, wage increase, it might be closer to the 26.5% wage increase for you guys as well. I'm just picking that figure out the air, so don't please hold me to that, uh, but it, it will be a much uh, larger uh, wage increase. Pathology technicians, we don't um, we've only got one pathology technician member at the moment. So if he's on, uh, please uh, have a chat to your other uh, technician buddies and get them to sign up to the union. I, I was trying to modernise your classification structure as well, but um, as I said, uh, the employers uh, balked at it. And because we only have one member as a technician at the moment, we didn't invest a, a hell of a lot of time in it. Uh, but what we've got is certainly better than the government wages policy of 10.6% if you're a grade one and 14% if you're a pathology technician uh, grade two. Next slide. And these are the new definitions for pathology collectors. Now, um, if you've actually read uh, your uh, current pathology uh, descriptors or your definition, uh, qualified is someone who has a state enrolled nurses uh, course in, in this enterprise bargaining agreement. I don't think that course has actually been on offer for probably 16 years or more. So how anyone was going to progress beyond a pathology collector grade one, uh, because I can't access a course that no longer exists. The only way I suppose you could get there is if historically you were a state enrolled nurse and you went across uh, to become a pathology collector or phlebotomist. So uh it, it was it was a trap uh people couldn't advance uh far beyond uh, where they were and what we've done is uh create a new classification structure so a pathology collector grade one is essentially um someone with no experience in, in someone who's working under uh, guidance of and supervision of pathology collector grade two or above and so it's, it's someone who's um uh, is not qualified uh, but they're in there and they're starting the process around um, learning what a pathology worker does and enrolling in their either their certificate three or certificate four in pathology collection. And the duties are listed there as well. I won't read through them. They've been sitting there for a while. You've probably read them. But what will happen is uh, a grade one will progress uh, automatically uh, to grade two where the employee completes the, the certificate or the certificate uh, four. Uh, in pathology. So it'll be an automatic thing. So you, you might not have even been a pathology collector for very long. You might be still doing your course, but soon as, you, as you've completed your certificate three or, or your certificate four, you'll automatically go to grade two. Next slide. Thanks, mate. So a grade two, um, has, essentially you have no experience uh, um, but because it could be that you've gone and done the certificate three or the certificate four uh, directly through TAFE and you actually haven't been working in the workplace uh, and gained that experience, but you, you either have a certificate three or a certificate four uh, in, uh, in pathology and the duties are listed there. They're the sort of duties that you are uh, required to do as a pathology collector grade two. If you go to the next slide, a pathology collector mobile, uh, essentially means uh, no experience uh, required works un unsupervised and uh, your qualification is you hold a CV3 or a CV4 in pathology collection your duties form the duties of pathology collector grade two within the community so we know uh, I've been uh, I was down at um, 
uh, Grace McKellar recently, and I've seen uh, pathology collectors uh, uh, in there uh, going into the aged care facility doing the pathology collection. So, you know, they're, they're the sorts of people uh, going to you know, elderly people's homes or into aged care facilities, you're mobile, you're out there, you're doing the community stuff. Uh, you're going to be classified as a pathology collector who's mobile. Next slide, thanks, mate. A pathology collector grade three, um, no experience uh, again required, but you work unsupervised. Uh, so these, are, these aren't ideal definitions, but this is it's all about negotiation, and that's what the uh, employer employer representative wanted. We wanted to be a bit more strict on this because we think that you know, if you're out and about uh, or, or a reliever or whatever. Uh, you probably need to have that experience. But anyway, it, it is what it is. Uh, so you hold the certificate three or the certificate four on pathology collection. Uh, in addition to the pathology collector grade two, uh, the pathology collector has a current competency in two or more of the following advanced pathology skills and who is required by the employer to undertake those skills and their roles. So that's the arterial blood gases, venous section, infant skin punches, and uh, also... We, it's probably not something that they're doing in public sector pathology at the moment, and that's the, uh, the drug detection stuff, you know, the urine uh, samples. But um, with the expansion of um, public sector pathologies across Victoria, we think that it will become something that you guys will be doing in the future. So and, and we know that we've got our pharmacy uh, members, for example, pharmacy tech members uh, who are working in the prison system essentially under contract from other public sector hospitals as well. So these, these things may uh, well evolve. We think they will. Uh, and that's why we've um, sort of forward proofed them uh, as well. Uh, the employer will provide the grade three uh, the opportunity to maintain their competencies by annual competency assessments as well. So any of those things that you're doing, you're going to make sure you're going to keep those standards up. Next slide. Thanks, mate. Uh, pathology uh, collection grade four uh, is once again no experience and works un unsupervised. Uh, as I, said, I can't believe the employers insisted on that, but anyway, they did. Uh, you can either hold a ticket three or a four, and in addition to the work of pathology collector grade three, where applicable, undertakes additional responsibilities associated with the coordination of work of other pathology collectors, including but li not limited to the administrative duties, managing rosters, staff allocations, training, and supervision. Next slide, thanks, Ben. Now that brings us back to the industry review panel. So if there's any classification disputes that arise out of the new classification structure, instead of taking it off to the Fair Work Commission, we can take it to the industry review panel. It's apparently going to meet once a month. And uh, I, with this new classification structure, I think there will be some uh, you know, people misclassified. So um, this is a great opportunity. It is only there for union members. Non-union members will not be able to use the industry panel. They're going to have to use the Fair Work Commission system and represent themselves. And uh, good luck with that. So um, without further ado, I, I've got uh, some questions that have come through. And I'll hand over to Cameron Granger, who's been keeping an eye on uh, the questions that have come through and uh, he can provide you with the answers. This isn't the only opportunity you're going to have to ask questions. We're going to get those descriptors out to you as well. Um, but the, the, the questions you ask help us develop the sorts of information that your the rest of your group might want that weren't able to make it tonight. So a frequently asked questions and answers sheet will be generated uh, from this session tonight. But if, you, if something else dawns on you in a couple of days time, oh, I should have asked that, it's not too late. Just email it into info at hwu.org.au. So info at hwu.org.au. Over to you, Cameron.